Our second reading for this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Hear now God's word for you and for all of us today. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus, who died, yes, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God In Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. O eternal God, we thank you for this witness from Romans, which we have just read, and for your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, who died for us and was raised, and who intercedes for us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our hope, our love, our strength, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, our passage today begins with Paul writing... Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. Well, the first half of that is quite reassuring, isn't it? The Spirit helps us in our weakness. But that second part, it seems a little bit harsh, even if it may be true. We don't know how to pray as we ought. We often can't find just the right words to express how we may be feeling or how to fully express our hope for the ways God can intervene in the various situations of our lives, right? Our prayers, they often seem inadequate. There may also be other times when We're not quite sure if what we're asking in prayer may be appropriate, even. For instance, this is kind of a silly example, but before I tee off on a round of golf, 
Is it okay that I pray to shoot around in the 70s? That seems a bit irreverent, doesn't it, when there are so many problems in the world, ones certainly bigger than my golf game. And don't get me wrong, I think prayer on the golf course is okay. Lord knows I need them. But perhaps it's better to pray that I have fun with my playing partners or that we all remain free from injury or even heat stroke in the summer, right? But these feelings of inadequacy, they don't just apply to prayers. I can assure you it's true of sermons, even. Confronted by beautiful passages of Scripture that have provided such hope and comfort over centuries, what are pastors to say? Where do we, where do I even begin? And to quote Paul from our passage, what then are we to say about these things? Well, perhaps better preachers than me don't have this reaction, but I suspect that even they do at times. And of course, it's good to be reminded that Paul, when he was writing, he didn't know that his words would one day become part of what we call the Bible, our canon. He was simply writing to a particular people, trying to address what was happening in their lives and how faith could guide them and inspire them. It's the very same task set before the humble preacher. And like Paul, I too can speak to the power of the Spirit, which indeed helps me in my own weakness. You see, early on in the writing process, I often find myself at a loss for what to say to you all. How do I speak meaningfully to a modern-day audience when we're talking about ancient writings? It's no small task. And yet the Spirit is always faithful always faithful, providing direction and inspiration for me and I know for Craig as well. And I can assure you that whatever is of value in my sermons, very little of it comes from me. The hope is that we would simply be a vessel through whom God speaks. Perhaps the biggest challenge for us preachers is to simply get out of the way But that's easier said than done. But in contrast, here in Romans, Paul does this rather magnificently. In just a few verses, he has offered up a number of incredibly powerful and meaningful promises from God. He also uses every Presbyterian's favorite word, right? Did you catch it? Predestined? Ooh, I'm joking, of course. I've yet to find a Presbyterian who is comfortable, let alone excited, about that particular doctrine, but I digress. Well, what then are we to say about these things? This morning, it's going to be a standard three-point sermon. I've already touched on the Spirit helping us in our weakness. Next will be that Not all things are good in contrast to what the plain language of our text might seem to say. And then we'll end with God's love is inseparable from us. God's love is inseparable from us. Well, our text, it's often one that you'll hear at memorial services, and I'm sure you can understand why those Last verses provide comfort to those who are mourning that nothing in all creation, even death, can separate us from God's love. But again, we'll talk about that more in just a bit. But you see, the reason I bring this up is because the best homily that I've heard so far was on this passage, and it focused on the verse that goes like this. 
we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. All things work together for good for those who love God. Well, this service, it was for a middle-aged woman who had died of cancer. A life cut too short. And I distinctly remember the preacher quoting that verse, and he said, Really? Really, all things work together for good? You see, he was making the point that this woman's premature death was in no way good. But he then went on to explain how this verse is often misunderstood. The Reverend Dr. David Bartlett, he comments on this and explains it more fully. He was a New Testament professor who wrote a commentary on Romans, and in it he says this. It's kind of long. I hope you'll follow along with me. He says, Several ancient manuscripts, including the oldest, have a slightly different Greek sentence that the Revised Standard Version, okay, we use the New Revised Standard Version. Newer is not always better. Okay, the Revised Standard Version uses this translation in contrast to the one we read. It says, We know that in everything God works for good with those who love him. Dr. Bartlett says, this reading reminds us that Paul is not saying that for Christians, everything is always for the best. What he is saying that in, that in everything, in everything, God works towards the best. Okay, you see that small distinction there? That's important. He goes on to say, I have found that to be a comforting reading of the text. When I have grieved or shared with others in their grief. Christians do not need to say that every tragedy or loss is part of God's plan. We can say, however, that in every tragedy or loss, God is still God. And God still moves our lives and all of history toward what is good. Even when contemplating the enormous tragedies of human history, natural disasters, or human viciousness, faith reminds us that God is still at work in the midst of evil, working toward the good. And finally, he says this, the question, why did God let this happen, is unanswerable. The questions we may begin to answer are, what can God do with this evil to help bring about the good? And how can we be God's partners, God's servants in that work together? So not all things are good, but in all things, God works for the good. Well, finally, we come to the high point of our passage, the culmination of Paul's argument, not just in our passage, but all of chapter 8. And numerous commentators mention that these may be some of the most comforting words we find in all of Scripture. You see, Paul lists a number of factors that people feel might separate them from God's love. It's quite lengthy. Hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, death, life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth. And then to cover whatever he may have missed, he includes a catch-all, anything in all creation. There is nothing in all creation that can separate us from God's love. You see, God's love is the most powerful force in all of creation. God's love can overcome any obstacle, can break through any barrier, even the ones we put up. 
Another New Testament scholar, Paul Ochtemeyer, he writes this. Perhaps the greatest comfort here in these words lies in the fact that we too are part of creation. If nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love, then in the end, even our own almost limitless ability to rebel against God is also overcome. And we are saved from our last and greatest enemy, ourselves. God has known us from the first and set us on the path of a destiny surrounded by his love. And so armed with that knowledge, we can face the future with hope and confidence, knowing that the Lord of all creation is a Lord of love, and that he is for us and not against us. So nothing we have done in the past, nothing we're doing now, nothing we will do in the future, nothing is able to separate us from the love of God. But you may have noticed in the middle of Paul's argument here, right in the middle of this uplifting and reassuring promise, Paul includes a rather discouraging verse. It goes like this, For your sake, for God's sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. This is actually a quote from Psalm 44. It's an acknowledgement that the people to whom Paul is writing, that they're experiencing very real consequences because of their faith. So Paul, he wants them to know that he is reassur not reassuring them lightly. He means what he says. He knows what they are experiencing. He knows what they're going through. And he reminds them that God's people have faced difficulties throughout our history. Today, we may not face persecution the same way that the Roman Christians did, but I know that each and every one of us experience frustrations, very serious problems in our lives. Faith doesn't mean that life will be easy, that life will be perfect. It simply means that we recognize God's presence with us in the midst of the struggles of daily life. And so again, we turn back to Dr. Bartlett. He says that for Paul, the world is populated with forces that call for our allegiance and threaten to control us. We could make our own list of forces, but the point would be the same. We are driven and enticed by forces stronger than ourselves, but weaker than God. Weaker than God. The power that is greater than anything in creation is the power of the Creator. It is the love of the Creator that we know in Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, what would our list look like today? What would be the forces that we feel might separate us from God's love? We've been through a pandemic, right? Oppression, depression, war, gun violence, political polarization, greed, addiction, natural disasters, personal tragedies. What things make you feel distant from God? May today be a reminder that God's love is more powerful than anything in all creation, that there is no place God's love and grace will not go, that God's love can cross any barrier Cross any crater or canyon or chasm we may put there. God's love is inseparable from us. Thanks be to God. 
Amen.